Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're talking with Stephanie Hanna, creator of The Other 85, about developing meaningful professional relationships, mindset, and more. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of The Law School Toolbox, The Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dictum. I also run The Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking with Stephanie Hanna about all the non-substantive skills you need for success as an attorney. So welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first off, talk to me a little bit about the name of your business, The Other 85. What does that mean? Yes. Yeah, so The Other 85 is based on the idea that only 15% of your job success is going to come from the hard technical skills. And The Other 85 is what my business focuses on. So relationship building, relationship maintenance, networking, how to put yourself out in the community, how to get yourself on boards, job opportunities, business development, all of those things wrapped up, make up The Other 85. Interesting. And how did you get interested in this topic? What's your background, whether that's academic, work-wise, etc.? Yeah, so I graduated law school in 2008, and the market was not great, if we recall. And We do I, recall. It was, right? I was actually just before that. I was 2006, so tail end of the boom, and it got pretty ugly pretty fast. Yes, and so, and I went to law school um, in Toledo and moved to Columbus, Ohio, and didn't know anybody here. And I moved here initially for a job in the prosecutor's office that wasn't guaranteed. And I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor, be in the courtroom. And so I started my career in 2008. And within the first maybe two and a half years, I had three different prosecuting positions because every time I got hired, uh, they were eliminating the position. Oh, no. Yes. So it was a very, you know, situation where I thought I need to be able to build some relationships and know some people and be able to start creating opportunities on my own because cold submitting resumes is clearly not a thing that's working. Right. And so I just kind of started getting busy, getting involved in bar associations, um, nonprofits, trying to meet as many people as I could and it was working. Um, I was getting a lot of job opportunities. Um, My background started in the prosecutor's office. Then I worked at the court. I was a staff attorney, a magistrate. Then I worked in a law firm, and then I worked at the Ohio State Bar Association. And in all of those roles, they were relationship-driven. I never submitted a cold resume. I never saw a job posting. It was people reaching out to me. Wow, and so, so that actually things, works. We always tell yes. people <laughs> tell people to do that, and you never know if it really is working for them or not. But you are yes. a success case. Go out and network, um, people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, everything was a result of relationships. And so friends started asking me how I was getting these different opportunities, and my advice was the same over and over and over. And I just thought there's got to be a way to put this into some sort of package and be able to help people um, because most of my friends, no matter what sort of organization they were working in, whether they were a solo or in a big firm or medium firm or government, they were having the same questions. There was just this gap and it started to be apparent that maybe law schools weren't covering it. Maybe professional (laughs) development, (laughs) right? (laughs) Maybe professional development programs um, at, law firms weren't covering it. And so it just kind of motivated me. And I, you know, joke that I had been doing the other 85 for free for a decade and most recently, you know, just formalized it in the last couple of years. Uh, But that's really what got me interested was helping friends and colleagues, watching them have success and realizing that there was a gap and that I had an idea for how to fill it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I mean, 
let's face it, most lawyers and law students really hate to network. And I think probably that explains some of the lack of con- I was, I guess, a chicken or the egg question. Maybe they don't know how, and so therefore they don't like it, or they don't like it, and therefore they don't want to attend programs on it or whatever, or the people putting on the programs don't want to think about it. I don't know what the issue is. Right. <laughs> but I think we can probably agree most law students, most lawyers really don't like networking. Most of them probably, frankly, aren't that great at it. Do you have any tips for shifting that mindset to be more positive? Yes. So I think two big mindset shifts that are crucial are the first is being a giver instead of a taker. I think a lot of times we approach networking and relationships, business development as I want the client, I want the business, I want the opportunity, I want the job. Um, And when we look at it that way, it's really easy to get really frustrated really quick. And if we shift our mindset to how can I add some value to this other person? How can I be a giver? Can I share an interesting article that I read? Can I give a case law update? Can I, you know, help someone if something as simple as they, you know, told me they were looking to go to vacation in this town and I've been on vacation there. Can I share somewhere that I visited? So is there any way at all that I can add value to someone else? And making that little shift turns it from this kind of dreadful task into something that we're all capable of doing. We can all have a conversation. We can all build a relationship. We can all add something of value to someone else. And that's the first shift. And the second shift is to think long-term instead of being so short-sighted. A lot of times we are looking for the quick return. And so if you are a short-sighted take, you are essentially looking for the job, the interview, the promotion, the business, and you need it now. And so when both of those things don't happen, we give up and we just stop doing it. And so if we are able to think long term instead of wanting the immediate fix and long term is like decades, right? I mean, people are referring business to friends that they've built relationships with over years and years and years. And when you start to recognize that all of your interactions are being small deposits into a larger bank account, and you've got to make continual deposits for it to grow um, so that if you ever need to make a withdrawal, there's enough in there for you to do so. Um, It helps. It helps you to think of it as a long game to recognize there's not going to be an immediate return Um, if something happens shorter than you expected then great that's a win but if not that's okay because you're in it for the long term I think both of those are such fantastic points on the first one um, I read a book many years ago I think it's Adam Grant maybe called like givers and takers (laughs) such an interesting book because I think sometimes people you know they hear what you're saying and like well if I just give and give and give, like, aren't people just going to take, take, take? And I think that book is such an amazing counterpoint to that, you know, where he talks about basically there's a balance. And sure, some people are you know, just takers and you probably don't want to give, give, give to those people. But that's not really what we're talking about. Um, yeah. And on the long term thing, it's so interesting. You run a website, you probably get these same emails from people who clearly have just gotten you from some list or I don't even know where they get it. Like, hi, I've written an article about whatever. Could you please link to it? And I'm like, who are you? You know, <laughs> like, no, yeah. I'm not just linking to your random article about like sleep beds. Like I run a law school website. Like what does this have to do with anything? You know, it's just yeah. like, I mean, I wonder if that ever works. Yeah, you know, I mean, the and in that book by Adam Grant, there's a really interesting graph that basically says that, yes, you know, takers do have long um, networks, but they're very, very shallow. Right. So people and like over, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of can get lucky one time and then people are done. Um, oh, and yeah. it, even, even back in the day, like occasionally I would read these emails and take them seriously. Be like, oh, maybe this is an interesting article. Now I'm just like, are you joking? <laughs> Exactly. Yes, people catch on quick. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I know know what program you're using to send your four follow ups. Just stop. Right. It's like very automated. Exactly. It's like very, I mean, Uh, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that's, you know, that's like such a great example. Um, Another, well, let me finish this thought about the book. Um, The interesting thing was that givers, even though initially maybe the success rate wasn't super high over the long run they were expen- exponentially more successful than the takers and so it just married the idea of yes be a giver and yes do it for a long time and it will reap 
the benefits that you're looking for. Right. This is kind of like the classic game theory. Like, okay, maybe you lose one game if you cooperate, but then long term, you're better off and everyone's better off, really. Yes. Yes. And the other, you know, thing to think about um, is, you know, We've all probably been on the receiving end where somebody is asking for a favor or looking for some sort of hookup and we haven't talked to them in years and out of the blue, here they are. And it might start with like a, you know, small pleasantry and hey, how are you? Hope everything's going well. And then here comes the ask and they haven't maintained the relationship. Um, And that just feels so icky to be on the receiving end. And so keeping that in mind, like try to not be the person that's making the ask out of the blue and invest in a relationship long term so that if you are, you know, applying somewhere where a colleague works or a former law school classmate, or you know, somebody that could put a good word in for you, when you make that ask, you have kind of something to withdraw against. um, And you're not just making it out of the blue and having them kind of question why you're reaching out in the first place yeah and you know there are like there of course are some people who the only time you hear from them like every two or three years is when they want a favor and you know by the second or maybe the second time you're still you know like okay sure i can by the third time you're like okay i literally only hear from you when you want something from me i'm not really that inclined to give it to you anymore (laughs) yes Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, And I do think, you know, sometimes lawyers are told like, oh, you have to be so aggressive and like make the, you know, give that whatever. I don't even know what the sales jargon is, you know, like always be closing or whatever. But like nobody wants to feel like on the receiving side of that, that that's what you're doing. So, um, yeah, I think this relationship building is so important. I mean, what do you have some suggestions? I mean, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, uh, I have no idea where to even start developing these professional relationships, what should people be doing either in school or when they're young lawyers? Yeah, I think, you know, being aware of it is a great first start um, because I will work with people who have been practicing for several years and this concept is very foreign to them. So being aware of the fact that relationships are important, that you need to find a way to start dedicating time to it is a really great first step. And kind of once you have that awareness, the next step is to figure out a way for you to be intentional about it over the long run. And so for some people that means 15 minutes a day. For some people that means an hour every other week. And whatever might make sense for you, and it's going to be trial and error, you've got to put it in your calendar. Um, And it can be as simple as professional development. That's really all you have to put in. You have to make it a recurring calendar appointment with no end date. Yes, I'm always a big fan of those. (laughs) Yes. And just, you know, having that visual reminder is at least something that puts it in your brain that like, all right, I have to do this. And then once you have that step in place, Come up with a list of people that you want to reach out to, whether it's people that you know that you haven't reached out to in a while. Um, And the the little blurb I like to say there is it's never too late. I have a lot of people who will say, well, it's been like two years. You know, that's fine. Just remind them of how you know each other and move on. Nobody's thinking about it as as much as you are. So it's it's not that big of a deal. Um, So it could be someone that you have met before and lost touch with, someone you want to get to know, somebody that won an award and you just want to send them a quick note of congratulations. If you read a great article, you want to send the author a note, um, kind of get your list together and then just start plugging away at it one at a time during your allotted professional development time. Um, And it sounds a little basic, but that's pretty much all it will take, um, especially when you are really, really busy. Um, If you have dedicated time and if you have a list, so you don't have to think about something to do when you sit down for that time, but you've got a running list and you're continually adding to that list as you're having coffees with people or thinking of people you want to reach out with, just jot it down on that list and then refer to it during your allotted time. And you'll actually be surprised at how much progress you can make uh, because a lot of times it's better than what you're, what people are currently doing, which is usually nothing. Right. Um, so <laughs> exactly. you'll, you'll find, you'll find a lot of progress really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I think that meta level is so important. You know, the what should I be doing and having that list going on an ongoing basis. I think that is a really critical takeaway because sometimes people have the best of intentions, but then every single time they see this pop up, they're like, oh, what was it? What I, I, I don't know what to do. Like, where mm-hmm. do I start? So I think investing that time up front, um, you know, whether it's having a physical list or I would always plug the Trello app, but my entire life runs on Trello. So you could have your Trello board with cards on mm-hmm. it, you know, mm-hmm. kind of move people through your process, you know, because part of this, you've got to keep track of it, too. 
Um, yes. Do you have any strategies for that? I mean, you know, there's nothing worse than somebody kind of reaches out to you and asks you to do something and then you don't ever hear from them again or they don't follow up or maybe they're supposed to, you know, you say, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to review your resume for you because I'm feeling nice today and then they never send it, you know, stuff like that just really is not helpful, I feel like, for yes, your networking no. efforts. <laughs> Yes. And so, yeah, there has to be some sort of system that works for you. So some people, it is kind of an electronic to-do list, whether it's in their phone or on an app or on the computer. Um, for some people, it's like a basic Excel spreadsheet and where I put the, like, who I reached out to on what date. Um, and then you can even take it a step further. And there are um, websites and products like Postable. Um and it's postable.com, and they are essentially electronic greeting cards. Well, I take that back. They are paper greeting cards that you um, get sent out through their website. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so you tell them who you want to send it to, what you want the text to say, and it will draft the letter and send it. And it looks handwritten. Um, it's actually really good. It's not just like a typed computer font. It's mm -hmm. very close to handwritten. Um and it's such an easy way, especially people who like to hide behind the, you know, my handwriting is bad excuse. Um, oh my gosh, how, like, I feel like my handwriting has gotten so bad. When I right. try to write anything, a postcard, I'm just like, wow, this is, my handwriting is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Plus I can't spell anything without spell check these days. Right. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah, so, yeah. so Postable will help and it will keep it an automatic um, reference list for you of who you reached out to, what you said, and the date. Yeah, and I think that's so important. I mean, I can he I can imagine someone's listening to this they're like, wow, this just sounds so transactional. But I think the key takeaway for me is like, I mean, ideally, these are people you actually like and you kind of want to get to know and you want to know better. Um, and you're not, you know, only reaching out to them because you think they could help you. Is that kind of your take on it too? Yes, absolutely. I mean, these have to be relationships that you are willing to maintain for the long run, because they're people you want to be around. You like their energy, you like what they're working on, what they're doing. Um, and a lot of times I think we'll find even people who are in high positions of leadership are not necessarily the most powerful, right? Or the most influential. Right. And so it's usually the people that are supporting them that can actually get things done. And so not being kind of power hungry or or title hungry and who you're reaching out to, but more about who is doing something that I'm interested in, who does has an energy or carries themselves in a way that I think is really cool and I want to learn more about their story. Um, and, you know, it may seem a little transactional, but it's really just putting systems in place to make it easier on you. Right. Um, you know, that's really the way I look at it is there's got to be a way to simplify it and streamline it or else we're not going to do it. And, Clearly, a lot of people don't have those systems in place, which is why networking tends to fall to the bottom of the list. Um, but with just a few small tweaks, I really think you can put systems in place to help kind of automate things just to get, help you get in the habit of recognizing that this is something that requires continual maintenance. Yeah, and I think part of it, too, is... You know, I think your point about just doing a little bit over time is so great. You know, so sometimes if people come to us, we also work with students sometimes on their career stuff. You know, I can't find a job like I struck out at OCI. I don't know what to do. And, you know, part of what we say is basically like, well, you know, let's start doing like one informational interview every two weeks or something like that's not that big, even once a month, that's fine, you know, preferably once a week. But I understand that's kind of a lot. <laughs> but even just doing that you know, say two, every two weeks, you're doing 24 of those a year. Like that's a huge forward motion, particularly if you're asking these people, you know, the right questions at the end, like who else do you think I should talk to about this? Like, do you have any thoughts for me? You know, from zero to that is huge. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, especially for law students, um, is don't think that this all has to be in person. Um, there's a, a portion of it that does and where it makes sense. But a lot of this can be over email, using LinkedIn, um, you know, handwritten notes, like it doesn't require you to necessarily get in your car and go have coffee with someone, although that's right. great. They don't all have to look like that. Yeah, and I think too, the thank you email is a lovely one. Like, I love it when people reach out and they're like, oh, you know, I've been listening to the podcast. That episode you guys did with Stephanie on networking was really great. 
And I mean, that makes me feel happy. And then almost no one really asks us for favors, which is fine. You don't need to ask us for favors. But in that case, like I would kind of be inclined, you know, maybe to do them a nice favor. I don't know. Feel yeah. free to ask. I think, yeah, that's the other thing. You have to ask for some of this stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about that? I mean, I know particularly women oftentimes have a really hard time actually asking for something. Do you have any advice around that? Yeah, you know, I started um, kind of this passion project called Cap your confidence and it is all about trying to kind of gaining confidence so that you can do the things that we are working on and the clients are all women in most of those programs and it's you know getting removing kind of the mental barriers that prevent us from making the ask you know doing the outreach putting in the work and it's not that we don't have the tools it's there's still just some kind of invisible mental block that keeps us from moving forward and so some of the things we work on there are you know are you doing things in alignment with your values are things so out of whack that are preventing you from taking that first step do we need to kind of recheck like what are our values what's important to us um some other things that we do are kind of playing out worst case scenarios and helping people realize that what you think is the worst case scenario is one, usually not that bad, and two, very unlikely to happen. Um, a lot of times in networking, people will say, well, what if they don't write back? You know, and okay, it's like, what if they okay, don't write back? They don't, then you could send a follow up or you could move on with your life. Those are pretty much yes. the two options. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, you know, it's funny when people say it out loud, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess that sounds kind yeah, of silly. Yeah, I guess but, I probably oh, wouldn't you know. like, actually die if they didn't respond to the email. Right. <laughs> but in their head, they played this up as like this, you know, it's turned into a real barrier that has prevented right. them from reaching out. Um, so, you know, things like that, talking it through with someone, you know, playing, role playing. I mean, that can be great too. Sometimes what's making you nervous and holding you back is that you don't feel prepared, you know, role play what some common informational interview questions or just some common things to <laughs> keep conversation going, um, things to help you feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, but, you know, also realizing that the burden is on you, um, especially as I would say a law student and an attorney early in their career. Um, you know, people want to help you, but you've got to make it easy for them. Right. And if you don't, there's 10 other people asking and they'll just move on. Um, and it's not for any ill intent. It's just what's in front of them and what's easy. And what's easy is just something to respond to, um, right? And just someone who's kind of teed up the question and made the ask and they just have to follow up. Right. I think some of this is really around getting clarity on what you're even asking for or what you want to ask for or what's reasonable to ask for. You know, you've got to kind of think like, okay, what could this person do to help me that they're pretty likely to possibly do? Okay, let me frame that and like really get specific. Because sometimes people, they're like, oh, can you help me with this? And my response is basically like, well, what exactly are you asking me to do? <laughs> you know? yes. Like, I need to know what you want me to do for you before I can decide if that is something that's reasonable that I'm willing to do or not. So yeah. I think, you know, your point, Mike, you've got to make it easy and you've got to do a lot of the work for the person probably makes it much more likely that you're actually going to get what you want. Yes, absolutely. And don't use your time with the person that you're reaching out to, to like help you process that. Like right. you need to do that before, because I will hear that from a lot of my colleagues who are now in, you know, positions of, of influence in their organization. And they'll say, you know, I met with this student or I met with this new attorney and like they had no idea. I mean, it took us so long to get this on the calendar. We had the coffee and like, what? Well, like you did not have questions written down. Like, right, like you, you did not bother thing. preparing for this. Um, if people yeah. are looking for a guide to informational interviewing, I actually have, it's a multi-part series I did a long time ago on the Girl's Guide to Law School. People seem to like it. We can link to it. Um, and awesome. if people want to find out more about this project you just mentioned, how do they find out about that? Where is it? Yeah, so everything is on my website, www.theother85.net. And then I am um, on Instagram and I post a lot about it there as well. Stephanie, the other 85 and on LinkedIn, Stephanie Hanna. Awesome. All right, cool. We'll follow up on all that at the end too. Um, but we are getting short on time. So I want to cover a couple more questions. Um, let me ask you about a specific scenario here. So I'm a first generation law student. There are no lawyers in my family. This could also apply for a young lawyer, I guess, after you've gotten that first job. How can I build my network when I feel like I'm starting at such a disadvantage? Yeah, I would say the first step there would be to kind of flip the mindset a little bit. Um, and, you know, even people who have attorneys 
employees and their family d don't necessarily come out at an advantage because they may not know how to network or build relationships as well. And so recognizing that kind of everyone kind of sucks at the beginning and everyone needs a little bit of handholding and and help in the beginning. And then the second part would be to, you know, reach out to, you know, kind of pie in the sky. And it sounds almost counterintuitive, but to someone in a different city or not an area that you're trying to practice and just introduce yourself, um, you know, look for some commonality, whether it's there, there may be, you know, from, uh, they may also be first generation lawyer in their family, if that's in their bio, or if they are from the same ethnic background as you, or if they went to the same same undergrad as you, um, and, you know, just, you know, the internet's a great thing. So you can find somebody and send an email um, and just introduce yourself and just, you don't even have, there's no real ask. It's just, hey, I just wanted to, I'm just trying to grow my network and I see that we have this in common. I just wanted to reach out. I'm a new lawyer in this city and I'm, you know, in the job search process, um, you, you know, I hope we can keep in touch. That's really it. You don't, there's no ask, there's no nothing. Um, and do that a couple times to where you start kind of building a little bit bit of confidence in that space because guaranteed people will write you back because um, you're, you're not bothering them. You're not asking them for anything. You aren't being awkward about it. You are finding a point of commonality and people love to help people. Right, exactly. Um, and they love to talk about themselves typically. Too. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, you know, that helps. And then you can start getting local, right? I mean, a lot of times people will say, well, I'm not emailing them because like, what if, you know, they I see them or they'll think it's awkward or that we could run into each other, you know, all of those things. Isn't that kind of the point? You're like, we want to run into each other. That's the whole point here. Yes. <laughs> yes. And for me, as a coach, sometimes it's easier instead of trying to dispel all those myths and tell them why that's a good thing. I'm like, all right, well, let's start somewhere that you're probably not going to run into the person, right? If that's making you so nervous and find a point of commonality and practice. Um, and then once you have kind of the email that you're sending out, save that and use that as a template um, and don't reinvent the wheel each and every time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then also, you know, find bar associations um, and other organizations that maybe, um, have I know here locally we're starting to have committees that are tailored to first generation attorneys um, and so I'm sure things like that are going to be coming up um, you know more and more as, be as it becomes more common and people are talking about it more often but whatever the thing is that you think is holding you back try and find others who are similarly situated and hear what is working for them and what sorts of techniques they're using um, and get some inspiration from that too. No, I think that's all great points. And I mean, frankly, most people in law school are probably like among the first in their family to be in law school. I mean, it's different in college, I think, yeah. you know, there, I think being a first yeah. generation college student is like, you know, quite a big deal for a lot of people. But I mean, I would imagine in law school, most people do not have parents who are lawyers. I mean, some do. Mm -hmm. My business partner, both of her parents were lawyers. She grew up in a courtroom. She basically had to be a lawyer. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean... I didn't know anyone in my family was a lawyer. Yeah. It just, you know, it's just, just a career path. <laughs> and then people right. hadn't taken yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Um, all right, before we run out of time, so we're coming up on the holiday season as we're recording this. Do you have any tips for building your network at holiday parties? I do. Um, and I actually wrote an article on this, which I will send to you um, so that you can link. And it is Perfect. called Five Ways to Take the Awkward Out of Holiday Parties. And so I've got five ways in there that you can feel more confident. Um, and it's everything from tips on how to be the friendly face and how to practice. And most importantly, how to make a graceful exit. Which yes, I think that is so important. Yes, <laughs> we actually just uh, just did, we recently did a podcast where we talked about that with some other things, you know, <laughs> um, yes. with someone. It was really interesting because people just, yeah, the just like, you know, you're in a group and you just turn around and walk off. Really not that elegant. There are, there, <laughs> yes. there are better ways to do this. Yes. Yeah. So I will give you that um, article and you can link that. Perfect. And they can read all of it. All right. Well, Stephanie, um, thank you so much for joining us. Any final thoughts you want to share on this general topic? Thanks so much for having me. And I guess my last thought would be, you know, there are so many good lawyers out there 
and being good at your skill and at your craft is really, really important. But I think to get us to the next level, we've really got to focus on the relationships and the things outside of the substantive part of the practice, um, because that is what really sets people apart, what really gets you ahead. And it doesn't have to be hard and it doesn't have to be something that is you know, a barrier or holding you back from moving on in your career or, you know, trying to find the first job, but just take it day by day, bite size piece by bite size piece, you know, start with one email, one introduction, talk to a stranger on the elevator. Um, there's a lot of low hanging fruit around us to practice hearing our voices and introducing ourselves and, you know, initiating conversation. And so take advantage of it um, because it will serve you well, um, no matter where you end up you know, after law school or, or after practicing. Yeah, a friend of mine who's trying to find a husband is doing a thing where she's supposed to introduce herself or talk to three strangers a day, which I thought was an interesting <laughs> approach to that. Right. But, you know, having that, even that minor goal, something like that, at least you can tick off like, oh, I didn't, I only talked to one stranger today or zero. You know, you've got to have some goals mm-hmm. here and manageable yeah. goals. All right, well, yeah. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining us. Um, just tell us one more time your website and where else people can look for you. Yeah, so the website is theother85.net, and I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, Stephanie Hanna, and on Instagram at stephanietheother85. Perfect. Um, Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed it. And with that, we are unfortunately out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.